hey, all my other friends played sports, well now I finally have something. Welcome to Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio, episode 248. And on today's show, we have Sensei Robert McQuaid. This is going to be a fun one. If you're new to the show, you should check out everything we do with this show at whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. You can find everything else that we do, all of the wonderful things we do, from the products to the websites to the services to the to all of it at whistlekick.com. We're always dropping in new stuff for you. And the best way to find about the new stuff is with the newsletter subscription. We do those just a few times a month. And it actually, I know that this is being recorded in the past versus when you're listening to it because we haven't figured out time travel. But I just put up a new shirt design in the store. People are going nuts for it. So if you want to know about the stuff, you got to check out the newsletter. You know what I haven't done yet? I haven't told you who I am. My name is Jeremy. I'm your host on this show. I'm the founder of Whistlekick, a sparring gear and apparel. I am a passionate martial artist, and I love my job. I love my job because I get to talk to people like today's guest, Sensei Robert McQuaid. He was a self-proclaimed lazy kid who only played video games all day, which is why his parents were forced, chose, <laughs> to send him to a martial arts school. He didn't want to go until he stepped foot in the door, and he became amazed by the movements of his instructor. And from that moment, he was focused on his goal of becoming a great martial artist, which, based on talking to him, based on what I know of the guy, he's certainly achieved. Let's welcome him. Sensei McQuaid, welcome to Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio. Thank you so much for having me. It's absolutely my pleasure. Oh, it is. It is my pleasure. As I've said on the show, I have the best job in the world. I get to talk to martial artists and call it work and... Indirectly, I actually make my living from doing this. So how awesome is that? And it's great to have you here. You know, we, we've been Facebook friends for I don't even know how long, but this is our first time really talking. Yeah, absolutely. We've been Facebook friends for quite a while. And um, ever since I, I heard the uh, the episodes with, you know, Master Dave Kobar and Master Chip Townsend, um, I was definitely a fan. And I, I was very happy to find you on Facebook. And hopefully, or not hopefully, I was very happy to ultimately connect with you and, and get myself on the show. It's it, it's amazing to be here. I'm very excited. Well, you mentioned some pretty great people right there. You are in good company and I'm in good company too, because I get to talk to you and I am always humbled at hearing the wonderful stories that our guests have to share with not just me, but with the audience who is, is out there in the ether in the future. <laughs> <laughs> we were just yes. listeners. We were just discussing that as the show has grown, the delay between recording and airing is something that we're trying to manage because Unfortunately, we have more than one person a week approaching, and I don't like to say no, so it, it's kind of built up this backlog, but we're working through it. We're figuring it all out, and regardless of any of that, you're here today. You're here to talk about martial arts, aren't you? Absolutely. Yeah. Um, something that we both love, something I'm assuming all of the listeners love. I would assume so. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> I know there are a couple out there that have just become fans of the stories, and I hear from them from time to time. They'll write in, I'm not a martial artist. But I find this show motivating or inspiring or I love the stories or whatever else. And, hey, cool. I'm, I'm not going to tell them they can't listen. Yeah, that's amazing. I didn't know that. Yeah. Yeah. It's certainly that's the minority, cool. probably, you know, 1%. Right. But, yeah, hey, you know, if, if someone gets value from the show, whether it's, you know, it keeps them awake while they're doing homework or it helps them fall asleep because they find the sound of my voice so terrible, I'm not going to take that <laughs> away from them. <laughs> that's great. Of course, we're not here to talk about listener demographics. We're not here to talk sure. about the ways that I, you know, could improve my my diction. We're here to <laughs> talk about the martial arts and your absolutely. role in the martial arts. So let's get started yes, with how you became a martial artist. Sure, absolutely. So um, as when I was younger, I was a little bit on the lazy side. Um, I would just come home from school, play video games. I was uh, not interested in exercise in the least. And when I was about 12 years old, uh, my mom had come home one day and told me she signed me up for martial arts. And I was also kind of a brat. I was a very spoiled brat where if I didn't like something that my parents did, I would you know, make it known. So I fought with her a little bit, uh, told her I didn't want to go. 
And I refused to go to my first class, which is uh, pretty amazing if you ask me now. And um, and when we went to that, uh, I had an instructor by the name of Brandon Apel. I can drop names on this, right, Jeremy? Absolutely. That's fine. Absolutely, yeah, please. Okay, cool. Uh, it was a guy by the name Brandon Apel. And as a 12-year-old, so Brandon was 18 and he was a second-degree black belt, which that was the first – experience I ever had realizing that black belts don't have to be like adults or middle aged. I always thought that like, oh, you're a black belt. You should, you know, you obviously have 20, 30, 40 years experience, but it's not that usually. Um, and this kid could flip and trick and it was the coolest thing in the world. And I fell in love. I absolutely loved it. Uh, and the martial arts became something I just latched on to. Uh, and my other instructor was uh, a man by the name of Bill Williams, who I still know and still learn from uh, to this day. He's one of my coworkers now, now that I run a school. And um, yeah, between him and Brandon and another guy who is still very relevant in our action karate family, his name is Michael St. John. His students call him Sensei Michael. Um, you know, those three guys really taught me a lot about my life, a lot about martial arts, and a lot about Kempo, uh, which is our style of martial arts. So at 12, year, 12 years old, I was hooked, man. Mm. I was hooked. So here you are, 12 years old, a self-proclaimed lazy kid. <laughs> yes, sir. That doesn't happen too often. People, you know, well, maybe I wasn't the most motivated. You know, maybe the parents will confess later on in life. It was kind of a lazy kid, but you're pretty aware of it. Were you aware of it then? Um... I don't remember exactly. I feel like, I feel like no, or, or maybe I was, I just didn't, I don't know if I cared. Like all I cared about was playing video games. I was very, um, I was, well, I don't know about that. Very, I know some people who are like extremely overweight, but I was, I definitely wasn't in good shape. I just wanted to play video games. Um, uh, I would stay home all day and, uh, I don't know if I, I might've known like, Hey, I got to do something about this, but I don't know if I was, uh, concerned about it, per se, uh, if that makes sense. I think I might have been aware, but not concerned. You know what I mean? And that's why when martial arts became like, you know, my mom was like, I signed you up for martial arts. You're going to go have fun. You're going to go, you know, exercise. I was like, whoa, 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 whoa. I don't want to do all that stuff. Um, and then sure enough, I I was like, this is pretty awesome. I think it was the first thing I found. I didn't really do sports as a kid. Um I, uh, I wasn't really too into it until I got older in terms of sports. Um, I'm now a very, uh, very avid soccer fan. I love soccer. Back then, I hated it. I didn't want to run. So I think, uh, I think martial arts was the first thing I really had that was like, oh, hey, this is like my thing. You know what I mean, sir? Yeah. Yeah. So I'm curious, what mm -hmm. kind of video games were you playing? Oh, yeah, that's a great question. Um, I actually have that in, in my notes for uh, hobbies to talk about later on. But I played a lot of uh, – I remember specifically around that, that time I had uh, Nintendo 64 uh, and I played uh, Super Mario 64 was one of my big ones. I used to play uh, GoldenEye. I had PlayStation 1. I'm a big – well, no, I had PlayStation 2. I'm sorry. I'm a huge uh, pro wrestling fan as well and uh, – so I played a lot of pro wrestling video games like SmackDown and that stuff. So, yeah, I used to do that a whole lot. Mm. Nice. I played some GoldenEye in college. I had some friends that were really into it. And this was the late 90s. And for folks that aren't video game fans, GoldenEye was one of the really first console-based shooting games where you could play against each other instead of just playing against the game. Yeah, it was and amazing. <laughs> it was a lot of fun. And yeah. these people, there were four of them that lived in uh, an on-campus apartment, and they scrounged four TVs, connected them what? together, and blacked out with construction paper the three quarters of the screen that showed the other people playing. Because typically, you folks, you would play with one TV. So they had this arrangement where they would sit in a cross pattern and they could only see what they were doing. They got into it that much. They had four TVs in the middle of the floor on a table, and and they just they went all out. You said gold. Oh my god! That. Yeah, yeah. It was a lot I wasn't that dedicated to it. <laughs> <laughs> I've never met anyone else that was. Yeah, right, right. That seems a little extreme, but that's cool though. If you got that set up, I guess once it's all set up, you can 
you were probably, you know, that person was probably the, uh, the king of the parties in his friend group. Absolutely. Now, here you are, you're 12, you went, you did a complete 180 from, I don't want to go to martial arts, to it becoming your thing. Right. How quickly did that transition happen? How quickly did it become like my total thing and, yeah. and what I loved yeah. from when I started? Was that your question? Yes. Okay, cool. Um, sorry about that. So I started and I latched onto it really quick. Um, and I was obs- obsessed for a few months and then something happened when I got uh, in our style Kempo, you reach purple belt around a year in. Uh, I know every style is usually different. Around purple belt, I, I left and I stopped for I think it was about like a month and a half. And I can't remember exactly why. I think I got so into it that like I went all the time and it got to be something where it was like I kind of burned myself out, I think. And I stopped going. I told my mom and dad I didn't want to go back and they fought with me, um, as you know, every good parent sh- should, you know, uh, and eventually I stopped going, I stopped going for about a month and a half. And then, then something happened where one day I was just like, man, I miss it. And I remember coming home from school and I was literally, I don't know why, but I was in tears. Uh, <laughs> and I said to my mom, I want to go back, call, call Mr. Williams, who was, who was, um, Bill Williams, our head instructor at the time the one I mentioned earlier, and see if he wants, see if he'll allow me to come back into class. And she did. And of course I was, and I latched back on again. Uh, but I think it was really quick, Jeremy. It was, um, very fast. I realized that, Hey, all my other friends played sports. Well, now I finally have something. Yeah. So I went hard and fast and then it caught up to me, took a break, came back and did it all over again. And it kind of hit me Again, uh, I got obsessed with it again around the time I was a brown belt, which is about two years in. That's when we started learning like j- jump spin kicks and stuff. And I thought, I thought that that class was extremely challenging, but also very fun. And uh, around that time, I started going to class every single day, um, which our schedule is uh, – people are recommended to go two times a week if they want to – um, accomplish perfect attendance in our, in our, um, in our, uh, school, but they can go every day if they want. We have unlimited attendance. So that's why I started to do when I was a Brown, but I started going every single day. And I think that was the peak of my, like, all right, now it really hit me. So it hit me early on, but about two years in is when it really bit me. And I was like, I was going every day. I was determined to make it on the demo team, which was a huge goal of mine. And, uh, and yeah, so that's when it really hit me hard. I would say about two years in. Hmm. Tell me about that demo team. What was it about that that interested you? Oh, man, it was the coolest thing I thought. I used to – so their practices used to be on Tuesday nights for, uh, right before my class – and this is when I was going every day. So I would go and I would literally sit there and watch the demo team. Um, I thought, hey, if I'm here, it's probably a better chance that I'd get invited on the team. The challenge I thought was, A, I was a lot older. Well, not a lot older, but our demo team was fairly new. So it was like, it's not like you would see at like Team Paul Mitchell or it was 9, 10, 11 year olds. And by that time, I was about 15. So I was older, I was taller. So I knew if I was going to get on the team, it would have to be in some, in some sort of captain role or coach role. So I knew I had to be really good. So I would watch their routines. I literally, at one point, I knew their whole routine. It was uh, to the theme of Bohemian Rhapsody by Queen. That's not really relevant, but I just like mentioning because I think it's funny. It's a good tune. Uh, what would you say, sir? It's a good tune. It is a great tune, but I would never expect a demo to do it. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, Normally you hear the bam, 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 de, 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 or, you know, whatever. Uh, but anyway, yeah, it's a great song. Um, and, and one day I was watching practice and I'll never forget this for as long as I live. I'm sitting there watching practice. Our coach uh, was Sensei Michael St. John, the, the person I mentioned earlier. And he asked me to come on the mat and I'm like, oh my God. And Jeremy, I was like, oh my God, this is finally happening. And he asked me to come on the mat and asked me if I would control the music while the team performed. 
And I was like, no, I thought he was calling me from the stands, like put me in coach. I thought it was time, but no, it wasn't. Um, so it was very appealing to me. Uh, and when I actually got on it, there was a time, uh, um, action karate, which is my company has, well, not my company, I don't own it, but it's the company I work for. Um, has an instructor here who was a like 10 time, I think, or 15 time world champion, Anthony Atkins. Have you ever heard that name, Jeremy? I have heard that name. So Anthony Atkins is our head instructor of our Huntington Valley school. And he came to us and he was already a world champion. So he like knew so much about martial arts to begin with. He was hosting a camp. It was a six week long camp and and it was open to all the schools, but it was only uh, – they were only accepting like 10 people, but it was like a couple hundred bucks, which for Anthony Atkins, if you've ever – and for those who are listening, if you get a chance to YouTube the name Anthony Atkins because he is a heck of a performer and a heck of a coach. But so when I saw that camp come up, I was like I knew I had to do it. I didn't know how I was going to do it because, again, I was 15. I was um, – I hadn't started working at all yet. Um and I had no money. <laughs> so what I did was I started picking up all my old video games and trying to see how many video games I could sell to try to take this camp. My mom and dad caught me doing that, asked what I was doing. I told them about it, and they offered to take me to it. And they said, if you take it seriously, you don't have to sell video games. We'll, we'll pay for it, but you need to take it seriously. And I said, this is it. This is how I'm going to get on the demo team. And it was me and five other people for – we trained for Friday nights from 7 to 9 o'clock with Anthony Atkins in Huntington Valley, Pennsylvania. And my dad took me every Friday. Um, so – and it was hard. It was really tough. But with two weeks left in the camp, uh, Michael St. John and Mr. Williams, you know, my instructors, asked me to be on the demo team. And it was the coolest thing ever. Uh, I was super excited. So with – Two weeks left in the camp, that was asked of me. A week after the camp ended, I was appointed captain of the demo team, which that camp was like obviously 95% responsible for me reaching those two goals. So I was very happy about it. What did that moment feel like? Because oh. there, there's a lot there. There's a lot of anticipation yes. and drive yeah. and... You know, you set that as a goal. You were very aware that you would have to be that much better than even the majority of the people because of your age. So what did that feel like when you finally were asked to partic not only participate, but be a captain? It was amazing. It was, I can't, it's hard to even describe it. There are two moments for me. Well, no, I'm sorry. There might be a couple more, but there are two moments for me that stand out as, the greatest moments in my martial arts uh, career, and that was absolutely one of them. I still remember walking in the office that day. I remember him sitting me down. I remember him asking me. It was literally like a 25-second conversation, but it was incredible because it was literally, do you want to be on the demo team? Yes, sir. Okay, great. That's it. You're on. <laughs> so to him, you know, to my instructor, it was a quick conversation for me. It was hours and hours and hours of practice and hard, hard work and dedication. Um, it was amazing. It was p possibly one of the coolest things I've ever experienced. Um, and at that point in my life, I hadn't had a moment like that yet. So at the time I wasn't like, like, Oh, I'm going to remember this forever. I just, I knew it was spe special. I just couldn't put it into words. I can feel the emotion as you're talking about it. I've yeah. had a few of those moments myself, but what I'm thinking about as you're talking about it is how many of those that we, we have in the martial arts, pretty much every yes. rank promotion or a, award for competition or being on a demo team. And really it's, it's a moment that is reflective of so many other moments of practice and dedication and sacrifice. Yeah. And the moment you've, I mean, if we think about it in terms of belts, you know, we, we earn a new color yes. or a stripe and then we go back to training you worked so hard to be on the demo team. You get on the demo team, but that wasn't the end of your work. I mean, you had to work just as hard, if not harder. Yes, absolutely. Um, it was very challenging. Uh, our instructor ran practice. Half of it was like 
actually performing our routines and the other half was just like strictly working out hard and doing drills over and over and over. I can't tell you how many chop punches we did. I can't tell you how many times I finger rolled a comma. Um, we used to do practices, especially with Anthony Atkins. Um, there were a couple times when we performed for the uh, Philadelphia Soul halftime show. Uh, and there was only one time where I got to do it because uh, I got on the team. And then the year after is, is when we did the Philadelphia Soul for the last time. And I think we've done it since then. I just wasn't on a team. I was just an instructor um, those times. But the one time I did it, I was – our groups – we had every demo team perform for the Philadelphia Soul. So we split them up into three groups. It was the, the basic, the intermediate, and the, uh, the elite team. And I was like, okay, I'll probably be on intermediate. I was amazed when I was asked to be on the elite team. So we were coached again by Anthony Atkins – and, and that was probably the most intense time I've had on the demo team because it was me and and I don't think I would admit it back then. Actually, I probably would. I was probably the worst martial artist in the room at the time because it was all people with 10 plus years more experience than me and I was still coming up. But I liked that. I learned a whole lot from those guys. I'd rather be the worst than the best um, in the room. Uh, I like to teach people, but at the same time, I love to learn. And that was just intense. We would practice sometimes for four or five hours at a time just to get ready for this one performance. But that was another intense moment is when we got to go out there in front of people. We had no clue who they were. And it was actually on a football field. And it was incredible. I never thought I would ever have the chance to do that. And had I not did everything I could to sign up for that Anthony Atkins camp in the very beginning, I certainly don't think I would have gotten there. Um, Maybe I would have. Who knows? But I definitely owe a lot to that camp. And uh, and as you said, yeah, the hard work did not end by making it on the team. It was a constant struggle once I was on the team to keep motivated and just to be like, no, I got to get better. I got to get better. I got to get better. So, yeah, absolutely. We're getting a glimpse into who you are and your approach to the martial arts as a lifestyle. I hope so. Yeah. Absolutely. Well, that's kind of the goal here, right? We're trying to tell your story. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. But I want to hear more stories. Okay. And if I was to put you on the spot, which is exactly what I'm doing right now, and say, what is your favorite martial arts story? What would you tell me? Okay. I have, um, I have a couple, but, but I'll try to keep them a little bit, you know, not like super long stories. But my, the first one that comes to mind is the first moment when I uh, knew I wanted to be an instructor. It was an instructor college which what we would do is we would have leadership team and instructor meetings, which would be like a half hour or an hour. And then there was the instructor colleges where it would be like four or five hours of just constant working on your skills and developing. There was one college uh, that was held by a man named Greg Silva. Do you know who Greg Silva is, sir? I don't. Okay. He's actually really amazing too. Um, he is, I would possibly put him in with the, the group of, you know, Master Kovar, Master, Master Rappold, and Master Townsend. But anyway, uh, Master Silva, he has an amazing book too, Building Black Belts from the Inside Out. And uh, so he, he was hosting this college for us, and I've never met him before. And it was one time I was, uh, we were doing inside crescent kicks um, down the mat, I was holding a clapper target for someone else. We were practicing our drills, and it was all the way down, and I was trying my best because, I, again, I've never met this guy before. I wanted to, you know, I'm not going to lie. I wanted to impress him a little bit. And, you know, I had my intensity dialed to about a 10. Uh, actually, I say about a 9 now because what I used to think was a 10, Master Chip Towns, and I heard his 10, <laughs> and, and I go about a 9 at tops. <laughs> so... I was doing it. I was coaching this kid, Greg Silva. I saw him look over at me and he calls freeze. And I'm like, oh no, what did I do? And he has everyone sit down and he highlighted what I was doing. And he said, look at this guy, listen to what he's saying, you know? And he, he had me do it again. And he's like, and he literally said the words, is he not going to be the best martial arts teacher we've ever seen? And I was like, holy crap, that's crazy. I couldn't believe he said that, but that, that moment was huge for me. I'll never, ever forget it. 
Um, and that's when I was like, man, I got to do this. I got to make this into something because if he thinks I'm that good, then I must be pretty good. Um, and that was probably one of my favorite moments ever. Uh, there was one more moment. Um, and this was once I was already teaching a little bit. There was a child uh, who was about so by this time, just to give you a glimpse, I was uh, I got my first teaching job at Action Karate when I was 16 years old, um, and I started teaching. And at this time, I was about 17, maybe close to 18. There was a little boy named John. He had Bell's palsy, so uh, it was hard for him to move around. Sometimes it was hard for him to speak clearly, but he was the sweetest kid you could ever imagine. Uh, and we would have belt promotions every three months. His father was asked to speak um, on one of the promotions. And I had no clue what he was going to say, but he was asked to speak. And he was reading his speech. And he called out me by name and talked about how I was John's biggest influence. Every moment I spend with him, it makes him happier. And he respects the heck out of me as a teacher. He, you know, John loves me as a person. And I couldn't believe it because I didn't know. I mean, to me, I was like an 18 year old kid and I was hanging out with kids and I was like, you know, asking them about their life. I was treating them like a normal person. So to me, it wasn't really anything special until that moment, until I realized that, man, this kid probably doesn't get that anywhere else. Well, maybe not anywhere else, but, you know, you, you figure Someone who has a hard, t- a hard time and who has those kind of challenges, there has to be people in his life who talk down to him, unfortunately, and teachers who don't treat him as, as a kid, which is what he is. And when his, fa- his father said all that, um, man, I'll never forget. I was t- tearing up. And then I didn't know my dad was going to be there that night. Which my dad, he came to a lot of stuff. My mom and dad came to a lot of my martial arts stuff in the beginning. And then it got to the point, Jeremy, where I literally I was going every day. So at that point, it was like, okay, you don't have to come to every class anymore. It's fine. I can go by myself. Um, and I didn't know he was going to be there. But he was. And he heard that speech. And I think that was the first time he realized what an impact martial arts had made on me. And in turn, allows me to make on other people. And he walked out because he was crying. And I was like, whoa. And I've never seen that. I've never been able to um, – I've never been able to put my dad in a position like that. Not that you know you, you want your parents to cry, but you would like them to cry for the right reasons because them being proud. So I would say, uh, man, that was huge. I'll never forget that. I'll never forget that kid or his father ever for, for as long as I live. Um, and then Master Greg Silva – Again, you know, uh, the other moment I mentioned, I owe my life to that guy. He was, you know, his moment made me want to become a teacher. There was a lot of things that led up to that, that kind of planted the seed a little bit that made me want to teach. But that was, if I hadn't had that, I don't think I would have been pushed over the edge, at least not yet. So I think those are my two all-time favorites. Um, Yeah, I think those are my favorites right there. Those are those are great stories. I appreciate you sharing them. Thank you. Of course, Jeremy. Of course. Martial arts clearly is a huge part of your life. I, we can say that of anyone that's going to come on this show. Yes, sir. But is it the only thing in your life? Are there things that you're passionate about outside of martial arts? No, actually. Um, in May of last year, so 2016, I got involved with something I fell in love with as well. Improv comedy. Really? And, yes, sir. Okay, so I, that, that's a first. That's a first out of all the episodes. That I think pretty sure really? you're the first person. Yeah, yeah. Woo-hoo. Tell us more. Yeah, awesome. That makes me excited. Great. So even if my stories about improv are awful, they're better than everyone else's so far. That's pretty exciting. Without a doubt. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, I um, I I took another break for, uh, from martial arts at the end of 2015. I took about a two month break. And it was basically the same thing again. It's all I've ever done. I was burnt out. I was ready to take a little break. And I actually took the biggest break I ever did. I was gone for two months, which for for most people you hear two months, you're like, ah, dude, be quiet. That's not long at all. But for something I've done my whole life, it was 
it was huge. It was very scary, but I was, I was at the point where I was so burned out and super like I was getting to the point where I was getting unhappy and it was affecting my teaching, affecting my students. And I had to take myself out of it for a little bit. So during that time, um, I ended up stumbling across another hobby, improv, improv comedy. And I looked at it and I was like, Hey, that sounds kind of cool, but I didn't do it yet. I kind of put it in the back burner for a little bit, about three or four months, maybe five months later. I, um, I looked online, I, I Googled improv comedy and a place called fit comedy came up the Philly improv theater. And, uh, I took a free intro class, which is just basically like a two hour, uh, beginners like, Hey, here's what our classes are like. If you like them, great. If you don't like them, uh, that's fine. And I was like, Oh my God, this is like one of the coolest things ever. It was the first experience I had of falling in love with a hobby since martial arts. And those are probably the only two, except for, um, being a big professional wrestling fan, but I'll save that story for later. Um, so I started improv comedy, uh, and that's another thing I just hit head on. I started 101 class and they have four levels, um, a year and some change later. Um, I started officially in July. I took an intro class in May. I started in July of last year, a year and some change later, I've completed, uh, just about their whole curriculum at that theater. Uh, I've taken a couple sketch writing classes. I'm into, I'm very big into a writing comedy now. Um, I enjoy it a lot. It's a very good stress and anxiety release. And uh, I actually just finished this week a class at a theater in Chicago. It is a online class uh, at their online theater called the uh, the Second City, which in comedy is one of the bi- uh, the biggest theaters. Yeah, Second City is the- a big deal. Exactly, exactly. It's it's where one of my heroes, Chris Farley, trained. Uh, and uh, and I was I was very proud of that. And I think I did. I learned a whole lot. And Again, that's another thing I just kind of tackled head on. So I performed there. I did a bunch of class shows. I invited some of my students. I performed outside of class shows. I was on an improv team for a little bit. Uh, I write often. I was writing last night. Yeah, so that's another thing that I was just like huge into because comedy has always been like a big thing for me. Um, anytime I take the world super serious, is it just seems stressful to me. So I always try to find a funny outlet or I always try to see things in the best way possible. And comedy really helps me do that. Besides the fact that that theater and Action Karate, so Fit Comedy and Action Karate are the two places I believe in the world that has the most positive people you could ever imagine. Mm-hmm. And it's just like incredible. It's amazing. It's like everyone's your friend. Everyone will let you do, you know, will let you talk about what you want and not judge you. And it's just really cool uh, that I was able to find those two places because I'll tell you, Jeremy, um, I don't know where I would be if I didn't. I really don't. So I think that was the biggest hobby except for karate I think I've ever found. Wow. And I can certainly see the synergy between the two. Anybody that's spent time in a martial arts school, and especially if you've trained in multiple schools, you know that the instructors that are better able to craft a story and integrate humor to their lessons are the ones that have the larger schools and the more engagement, especially from the younger students. So I would imagine that as you've improved with your comedy, you've seen more of a response from those you're working with. Oh, absolutely. I've been, you know, I've been happier. I've just been like, I think more like pleasant to be around since I started comedy. Um, I try to, I think the hardest part is finding a fine line between being fun and always being funny. And that's actually a quote I'm stealing from master Kovar is to be, to be fun, but not funny because you don't want, you don't want to be the clown in your classroom because of course you want to be respected. So, and I think I'm, I'm finding a pretty good balance with that. And like I said, just like the fact that I'm happier and it's just like a cooler experience that even if I have a stressful day, my students pick me up because I, I love my students to death. I can't tell you enough about that. Uh, and, um, which actually reminds me, I, I would like to tell a story at some point about a student who just moved. Uh, but I'll save that for a little bit later. Okay. But, um, yeah, just, you know, I think 
the fact that if for whatever reason I'm having a tough day at the dojo, I can go see an improv class or, or not, or, or sorry, an improv show and everything just falls together. So everything just feels better after that. Rough days are universal. I mean, there, there's oh, nothing yeah. more universal than the ups and downs of life. I mean, yes, everybody sir. gets that. I'd like you to tell us now about a time where things were rough and you didn't lean on comedy, but rather martial arts mm -hmm. to help you move through it. Okay. So here's, here's one times in, uh, in particular, the first one that really comes to mind. My mom passed away when I was 19 years old. It was, uh, December 23rd, 2009. And I remember she was pretty sick for a while. And of course, as an adult, I knew that she wasn't going to be around forever. But the, the kid in me still wanted her to be around forever. Of course, I think everyone does. And so my instructors knew very well that my mom was sick. Uh, she wasn't able to make it to a lot of my belt promotions as she went to the first few. And then afterwards, she got sick. Um, well, sicker, I should say. She's, you know, she was always, for as long as I can remember, had um, had some illnesses. So she was uh, very um, tired a lot. So she wouldn't be able to come see my classes or belt promotions as often as I like. But she always watched the videos, and she clearly cared. Um, and she's the one who who signed me up for martial arts. Which again, had I not, you know, had she not done that, <laughs> again, I don't know where I would be. Um, so when she passed away, it was. It was extremely challenging. Of course, of course, we don't always get along as a mother and son duo. Never really do always get along. Um, you know, we were very much the same person in terms of we were very hard headed. And you know how when two people who are hard headed, you know, sometimes they get along very well and sometimes they butt heads, of course. So when she passed away, um, it was extremely hard. Uh, I was, I had just received, um, I can't remember which belt it was. I think I had just gotten my second degree black belt at that point. So I was, I was very focused on that. Um, you know, she passed away. It was, it was, it was very hard. You know, there were a few days where I didn't feel like I had direction. I didn't feel like I had motivation to do anything. Uh, it was very hard for us to plan. She was, um, cremated. So she had a, just a, uh, ceremony versus a, like a full off funeral and a burial. So, it was very hard. Um, it was very inspiring, though, to see my instructors, Bill Williams and Michael St. John. They sh they showed up to her ceremony that day, and I I thought they would, but I knew they didn't have to. And they were there, and they were there the whole time. And it was really just like, wow, these people are going to be in my life forever. And I kept my chin up, pushed through, uh, and. I use martial arts as as a, a huge memory of her, and I think if I didn't have th that, it would be a lot harder of a road to go through. Um, so when I think of her and I think of martial arts, I think of what she gave me. I think of, you know, how if she hadn't signed me up that day and hadn't pushed me when I fought her and told her I didn't want to go, I wouldn't have what I had now. Or, or I wouldn't have what I have now and I wouldn't have met the people along the journey. And it was huge. I was, I was very down and I think my instructors were there to kind of help push me along. I went into work the day she passed away. I found out around 12 o'clock I texted my boss and I told them and I didn't hear back because, uh, I, you know, I don't know. I guess they didn't know what to say, or I guess they, you know, they would talk to me in person. But I went to work th three hours later, and my boss lo looked at me and said, "What are you doing?" And I said, "I don't know. I thought I had to come in." And he said, "Are you okay?" I turned around, broke down in tears, and said, "No, I'm not." And he said, "Okay, go home." So I went home, um, and then I stayed home that day. I came back the next day. And, you know, they were there for me every, every step of the way. And I can't help but think that, well, no, it, it's not that I think it's what I know. I know that a lot of other 
professions in the world, while there are many who are, you know, that are absolutely amazing, I can't help but think that the connection I had with my instructors was so strong then. I don't know if I would have had that in any other job I would have got, especially not as a 19 year old kid. Um, so that was probably the biggest one that I leaned on for martial arts because if, had I not, I don't know where I would be or I don't know what I would have, I don't know how I would have moved on, you know? Wow. Utterly powerful. And it's, it just adds another layer to why you're so tied into the martial arts and so loyal to these folks that have treated you so well. Yes, sir. And I know that, you know, I, I have, you know, I, both of my parents are still alive, so I don't have anywhere close to the same story, but I have similar stories, stories where I was surprised at the kindness that a martial artist would show someone for no reason other than they could. And right. I know that a lot of you out there listening have similar stories. And I'd like to think that we as martial artists, as a community, a worldwide community, we treat each other better than probably any other community on earth. Oh yeah. I would absolutely agree with that, sir. Hmm. Now we've talked about your instructors. We've talked about your mother and how important she was in getting you into the martial arts. You may not have started. We may not be having this conversation had it not been for her. Yes. Now outside of those folks, who has been the most influential on your martial arts upbringing? Ooh, um, there's a few names that come to mind immediately. And I mentioned, uh, uh, I think I mentioned most of them already. Uh, you know, we got master Dave Kovar, who, if you guys hadn't listened to his episode on whistle, please do. We'll Very, definitely link it in the show notes. Oh, absolutely. Extremely powerful individual. Um, the first time I met him was at an instructor college for one of our schools. And I remember it almost didn't happen because we had set up, we were a brand new school. We set up a program that day at a Girl Scout troop. We told our our boss, our owner, that we had set, had set up that program, and he said, cancel it. And I was like, wait, what? What do you mean? And keep in mind, we're a brand new school, so we're like any, any student we can get. You know, We're trying everything we can just to survive at that point. And he said, cancel it. And I couldn't believe it. Could not believe it. And I was like, why? He said, because you need to be at this seminar. And I had never met Master Dave Kobar. I didn't know anything about him. I didn't hear anything before then. I went to that class and I was hooked on every word he said. Uh, you know, there's quotes out there, you know, when the real, when the real leader speaks, people listen. That's him. 110%. And I have gone to every Master Kovar seminar I could possibly go to since then. I have read his book multiple times. It is probably one of my most influential. Um, it's probably one of the most influential books I've ever read in my life. And I go to him for advice on a, a constant basis. Uh, so that's Master Dave Kovar. Master Chip Townsend, I only had the pleasure of meeting about a year ago at a board breaking seminar. But he has been just like extremely um, – so what I'm looking for, like reachable, I guess I would say, like it's, it's extremely easy to, to get a hold of him and ask his advice yeah. and to talk to him. And, you know, so whenever I do a live video, um, I'll try to, you know, if I mention him, he'll share it. Even if I don't mention him, if he loves the story, he'll share it. And that's just like huge. That's like such support from a person I've only met once. Uh, but he's incredible. Um, I mentioned to you before I was trying to get uh, Master Christopher Rappold on the show, um, and I still hope that episode comes about one day. Uh, I just know he's extremely busy, but he's been – he's another just like extremely influential martial artist in my life. Um, one of the nicest guys I've ever met, uh, extremely knowledgeable. So Master Chris Rappold is the – he was the uh, coach, either the coach or the founder, I can't remember, but of Team Paul Mitchell. And uh, he is a multi-time sparring world champion. He actually designs Action Karate sparring curriculum. And he helped uh, Master Kovar in producing the Done With Bullying program, which is a program that uh, we were able to host at our school recently. 
So I think without those guys, I wouldn't have that program and I wouldn't be as passionate about it as I am. But those three are the first names that come to mind uh, in terms of people I know specifically, um, in terms of people I've met and encountered. And yeah, I think those three are huge. Of course, the first two that you mentioned are past guests on the show, and yes. we're hoping to get the third on the show. For anyone that might be new, we'll link to those episodes at whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. Amazing. Great. And as you were talking about Mr. Kovar, yes, one sir. of the things that, that, that struck me, a memory that I'm not sure that I've shared on the show, I've only met him in person once, mm-hmm. and it was at an event in upstate New York. Um, one of these multi-day seminar events, and this particular one is called Super Summer Seminars, a fantastic event. I'd encourage anybody to go if you can. And the first year I went, Kyoshi Kovar was one of the 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 head guest instructors, one of the, the guests of honor. And he taught a couple sessions that weekend, but when he wasn't teaching, he right. was watching what other people were teaching. Now, here's a man with legitimately 10 black belts, Yes. <laughs> An out, utterly outstanding martial artist who is known worldwide for being one of the guys that people yes. go to for oh, knowledge yeah. about how to run a school as well as actual martial arts practice. Yeah. But here he was observing what everyone else was doing, watching, trying to learn from them. And that right there, like once I realized what he was doing, that told me everything I needed to know about him. And it was because of that that I made such an effort to reach out to him because he's a busy man. And it took us oh, a yeah. fair bit of time to get that interview coordinated. But I wasn't going to let up because I knew he had great stuff to share. Oh, yeah. Amazing. I very much enjoyed that episode. If you could train with someone you haven't anywhere in time, anywhere in the world, living or dead, who would you want to train with? Okay, so there's, of course, the obvious answer that I'm sure everyone says. Bruce Lee's up there. Um, I'm going to go with a little bit – I'm going to go with someone different though just to be just to be more original. And again, I would absolutely pick this person as well. I would choose Tony Ja. And Tony Ja is uh, – for anyone who's listening who's not familiar, he's a uh, – he's a Muay Thai martial artist who uh, – who starred in some pretty amazing martial arts movies, but it was uh, a movie called The Protector that came out when I was a teenager, which was right in the, um, excuse me, right in the middle of my like hype about the demo team and stuff. But this movie called The Protector, and a lot of it's like really, really cool, like flippy stuff uh, that you would see in some martial arts movies. But there was also a lot of like he showed a, a lot of the Muay Thai style. And, you know, the knees, the elbows, the breaks and all that cool stuff. And I just thought that was super fascinating. And um, uh, Muay Thai is a style that I've always been fascinated by, but never really trained in. Um, And I think, you know, it would be him. I would love to learn from him. I think that would be amazing. Uh, and And if I didn't pick him, I would go with my childhood martial arts idol which is Jackie Chan. Um, and I used to love Jackie Chan. I used to watch the cartoon on Saturday mornings, the Jackie Chan show or Jackie Chan experience or whatever it was called, where he would just be an animated fighter. And I used to watch a lot of his martial arts movies. Uh, and I would, uh, I was a huge fan of his rush hour movies with Chris Tucker. And I think that was like, I love them so much because they were a combination of martial arts and comedy. And I was like, this is me right here. Uh, so I would say Tony Ja or Jackie Chan are my two biggest martial arts influences who I've never met. Uh, I think those are those guys are up there for sure. Absolutely wonderful actors. Tony Ja, I think when I look back over the last couple decades, there's someone that I, I – I wished we had seen more from something happened, something, you know, just didn't translate for him. I don't know what it was. I don't know if he has a bad manager or what, but hopefully we'll see him at some point because he's still young and still has tremendous skill. I'm sure. He's incredible. Now, when it comes to Jackie Chan, I don't think there's anybody out there who isn't a fan of Jackie Chan. If you are, I want to hear from you because I want to know why. Yes. (laughs) And you mentioned Rush Hour. Rush Hour is classified as a martial arts film. 
which makes it the top grossing martial arts film of all time. There you go. There you go. It's probably because I've seen it so many times. <laughs> it, it, it is entirely because of you, and, and well, yes. I certainly helped with some ticket sales on that one. Yeah, of course, of course, sir. Uh, they're supposed to be making a TV show now, which I don't know how I feel about, but we'll see. Yeah, we'll, we'll see what happens. <laughs> now, you, you mentioned the demo team, and I'm assuming the demo team did some demonstrations at competition? as well is that yes something? sir okay so let's talk about competition and your experience and what you took away from it sure absolutely so we performed at um a lot of we've never done like this the circuit as um a competition martial arts experts usually refer to it as you know the nasca circuit or which is national american sport karate association for anyone who doesn't know and that's like the national tournaments. We very much just competed within our own action karate tournaments. And I did a couple. I actually did not attend my first tournament until I was a red belt, which is right before black. And I think most styles, but especially in ours, um, I guess not especially. That sounded quite arrogant. But <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, yeah, only our style. Anyone else is wrong. But no. Um, so we competed at the tournaments. We were never really like the best, but I was always proud of just, just how we clicked and how we just got along and we just had fun, you know? Um, and my first tournament is actually uh, a story I'd like to share. We still have time, right, Jeremy? Oh, by all means, we have all the time in the world. Beautiful. So it's a story that my students very well know, but so I was, um, training for my first tournament. I didn't go to a tournament until I was a red belt because my parents didn't have a car. And it was, it was never at our school. It was always at like a central location with where all of our locations were able to get to a little bit easier. So it was at like a high school or a gymnasium, you know, the deal, you know, wherever we could find a good spot. So I went to my first tournament. I, I opted to spar. I did sparring and I did our creative katas. I had no idea how hard either of them were going to be. Uh, so I prepared, I practiced, I trained, I sparred a lot. Um, and I was pretty like, I was older, so I was a little bit, I would say I was probably in the, you know, our school was newer too. I don't mean to sound like, like I don't want to sound arrogant, but I, you know, because I was older, I trained every day. I was one of the better spars at our location and, and because of how much I attended, I had I was confident. There's a good word, confident in my abilities. Um, so I was confident in my abilities. So I expected to go to the tournament, and I was like, all right, it might be a little bit of a challenge. I think I'll do pretty well. I'll probably get like first place or second place. You know what I mean? Because I'm really good. Um, I go to our tournament uh, and I spar first. I get there. I throw on all my gear which I know some schools, you know, you do less gear, some schools, you do more gear. We have a pretty, pretty hefty set of gear, you know, helmet, uh, hand guard, shin guard, mouthpiece, groin cup, uh, foot gear, ch chest gear. We're pretty, you know, we're pretty stacked in terms of how much gear we require for our students. So I went to spar. My first round was against a student who, and again, I was a little bit taller, uh, but it was, it was more broken up by age and, and belt rank. I think he was a little bit younger than me. I was I was a lot taller, maybe maybe at, at least almost a foot taller. Nah, maybe less, but I was significantly taller than this child. Well, not child. Uh, well, we were both kids. Anyway, I went to spar. I was pretty confident. I was like, okay, I got this. Um, and he destroyed me. He just like, I mean, it was to three points. I got one point. He got the other three and I was out and it was a tournament. It was a tournament when it comes to sparring, especially. So, uh, I didn't get to spar again that day. I was like, oh my God, I was devastated. And I remember, and I remember being devastated. My dad was there to watch and I went over to my dad and, and I of course expected him to say something along the lines of, uh, you know, comforting or, you know, be like, it's okay, buddy. Uh, you should have won. Or I even expected him to, to take my side. I don't know why, but I expect him to be like, oh man, you know, that shouldn't happen. You know, I feel like you got to point that time. He, you know, I expected him to kind of argue for me or, or like have my back. Yeah. That's what I thought having my back was at the time. 
what he said to me was, oh, man, you lost. Oh, well, that's you have to try harder. Do it again next time. And I was like, well, I was like, what? That's the only fatherly advice you have? And I was upset that I lost and I was upset that he didn't comfort me. Looking back on it, I tell all of our parents at our school, you should say the exact same thing and tell them to push harder because that was my – I didn't appreciate that moment enough at the time as I do now because had I not, I would have been like, okay, I don't have to train harder. I'm just going to keep doing what I'm doing. I'll go to the next tournament and I'll win. I would not have won if I kept doing what I was doing. But what I did was I heard that advice. At first I was upset. A week or two later it it sunk in and I was like, okay, I'm going to train harder. So I sparred every chance I could possibly get for the next six months. Our tournaments happen uh, um, twice a year. Um, Six months later I sparred again. I didn't spar the same gentleman. I don't know where he was or what he was doing, but I didn't spar him again. And that tournament, I got first place. Had I got first place the first time I went, it wouldn't. It would not have mattered nearly as much. And it was the struggle and the persistence and the perseverance that I had to do or had to show the next six months in training every single week, even though I didn't want to all the time. That's what made it mean more. So that's what I tell all of our parents, all of our students, that if your child doesn't win, that's usually better, especially with their first tournament. Because if you win, you get that sort of like, oh, I'm good. Now I expect it every time. And uh, and that's just not good. You know, We want to teach our kids that you can't always get what you want. You have to try your best, push really hard, practice, and then, and then guess what? You st- still might not get what you want because that's what life is. You can give 100% and still not win. And I think that was the best le- lesson I've ever learned from a tournament by far, ever. And I still tell people that to this day. Um, I have that story all written out on my Facebook page and I post it every single tournament because I I think it's super powerful. Um and by the way, I didn't win, you know, my first tournament. I didn't win my creative form either. You know, I got last place with that. Uh, and last place went home with nothing. So I literally, um, our tournaments are usually designed where if you do the set curriculum, you can at least leave with a medal or trophy. And I opted to, uh, to do two events where I wasn't guaranteed either. So I went home that day with absolutely nothing. And was I upset? Heck yeah, I was upset. Was it... Was it worth it at the time? No. Weeks later, months later, and especially now years later, that I can share this information with listeners and and, um, students and parents at our school, it was extremely worth it. Mm. Powerful stuff. Yes, sir. What you've just mentioned, what you've just outlined, to me, is the entire reason for competition. Oh my gosh, absolutely. It is, it is a carrot. It is a, it is a way to motivate yourself that a lot of people don't have within their school. Most schools have time requirements and skill requirements and all kinds of things before you can progress, before you can be recognized for what you've done, for the hard work. Excuse me. And especially when we're younger, we tend to crave that outside validation a little bit more. But competition... Yes is a great way to receive some of that validation in a shorter time period, you know, to go work hard for two, three, six months. Yes, sir. And to go back and say, I did better, you know, to, to draw that connection. And that's why I love competition. Absolutely. I would a hundred percent agree with that, sir. Let's talk about the future. Future. Okay. Um, what What are you working towards for? What's you're You're still clearly hyped up on martial arts. You still love it. That's clear. It's coming through yes, sir. very well. But I guess the question is why? What What is it that you're hoping to accomplish in the rest of your martial arts career? 
I would love, I mentioned to you, uh, Mr. Jeremy, when we first started speaking about this podcast, um, uh, that the most passionate thing I think, the thing I'm most passionate about in the martial arts strictly is the, the done with bullying program. As a kid, I was, uh, bullied heavily. Um, and for a long time, I didn't really know how to deal with it. I, um, and it's getting worse, sir. It's getting a lot worse these days. Kids are getting bullied earlier. They're getting bullied more intense. Um, people are committing suicide. It's in, it's, it's in, it's absolutely crazy to me that it's getting this much worse. And I think the done with bullying program is something I really try to make my own every single year. Of course, I, I use the program for master Kovar, master Rappold, but my goal for that program, and this year we've gotten closer than we've ever gotten, uh, which if anyone would like to watch it, I do have it, a video of it on my Facebook page. I don't know if I can get that to you somehow. Uh, but my goal for our Done With Bullying program is to run a program with our entire mat and parent area 100% full. There's no reason I see that people can f- fill up a – I don't know, you know, what a, you know, like a concert or you know, an, another – super filled up and popular event and and we can't fill up this free empowering program that's going to help somebody and that's one of my biggest goals um in terms of teaching i am uh going to be testing for my fourth degree black belt suit um so i'm working toward that Uh, that's very exciting um and I am not yet an owner of a school, so that is in my long-term goals is, in, is to, to own my own martial arts school one day. So those are my three biggest goals right now. Uh, yeah, I think that's – and I just, I just want to impact as many people as I can um, and for my students to understand that they have somebody who cares about them and – and these people mean a lot to me, and I just want to keep doing it. You know what I mean? Uh, uh, do you mind if I share a story about a student who moved no, away this past weekend? Not at all. Please do. I, this was really powerful for me. Um, so we had a, stu- a student who uh, he was very – he was about three years old when he came to us, maybe four. He's been with us for about two years now, so he's about five or six years old. Uh, and this – this kid, he, he was a challenge in the beginning. Um, he would spin around on the mat and, you know, he would run off the mat and he would call out. And if he didn't win, he would freak out. I'm not going to lie. For a little while, it was the point where if he came in the school, I was like, OK, I was preparing for a stressful class. One day I changed that. And I changed that with him and multiple other students. And I don't remember what made me change it. I'm sure it was some sort of Master Kovar speech because that's always what motivates me to begin with. Um, but it, it, it changed. And in, instead of being upset that he walked in the door, I started doing everything I possibly could to be excited and to treat him like he was the most important person in my life. And I did that with a couple other of my challenging students Um and oh boy, oh boy, did it show. He he went from being ch- challenging to smiling more. He still wasn't able to – well, I mean he always smiled. He got very excited. But he got less disruptive. Um, he tried harder and he loved being here and it really showed. And I loved having him here. And was he still a challenge sometimes? Of course. What a lot of people don't understand, he's a six-year-old kid. He's a five-year-old kid. They're always going to be challenging sometimes. There's no getting around it. Um, I found out a couple weeks ago he was going to be moving. And he's moving across the country. And for you know privacy reasons, I won't say where. I won't say his name because he's a student and not like a instructor or coworker. Um, so he's moving across the country, and I was really upset. And I think the main reason I was extremely upset was because you know, A, I got g- genuinely happy to, to see this kid and to see him made me happy. And a lot of my students do, but I think this one was special because I think he really responded to me showing how much I care about him and his family. And, uh, 
And he taught me about life, man. He really taught me just to be like positive and, and upbeat. And he's, he's overcome so many challenges since he's been here. So Saturday was his last day at our tournament. And I said goodbye to him on Friday because, you know, we have a busy day at our tournaments. We're judging the whole time. And um, he saw me on Saturday. He ran up and I was in tears, like not heavy tears, but I was just tearing up a little bit. And I couldn't believe it. I was like, I, I don't cry at, at every student leaving because if I did, I wouldn't have any tears left. I'm sorry to say, but people quit all the time, man. You know how it is, I'm sure. Um, people quit for reasons here and there. And um, I taught a lot of people their last class. I'm not proud to say it, but I did. And just and this was different, you know. Um, I've seen him grow and he taught me a lot about life and you know, he said goodbye and he saw me tearing up and here's this, this six year old kid who, who says, it's okay. I'm not going away forever. And I was like, dude, you got to go, man. Cause I couldn't stop. I couldn't hold it in. So I gave him a hug. He left. He literally was, his mom told me that they were in the car with their animals ready to go right from there. I don't know this, the situation and why they had to leave. She assured me that it was it was better for their family. So, of course, I'm very happy for them. I don't know why they had to go. I don't know if it was something urgent. I hope I hope for gosh not. And if it is something urgent to where they were in some sort of trouble or danger or whatever, I'm glad they were able to get to safety. Um, uh, so I calmed down. A couple people I saw at the tournament, you know, they asked, am I OK? And I said, yeah, I'm fine. I'm just sweating from my eyes. Man, it's really hot in here. And I walked away. Uh, <laughs> so five minutes later, the kid comes back in and I'm like, Oh no, I just composed myself. And his mom said, he started to get upset. He wanted to say goodbye again. And it was powerful. And I think, you know, I was, you know, every once in a while I get to the point where I'm burnt out and I'm tired of doing this every single day. We're not tired of it. Like I said, man, I just get burnt out. You know, it happens to the best of us. And it's like you said, you know, ups and downs are a huge part of any business, of any job, of any career. But him on Saturday, it just showed me why I do this. And I've never, you know, uh, there's been times where I've got upset that people left. But I think when I realized that, man, he taught me more about life than I could ever teach him. And I think it was the it was the moment I stopped getting ups, upset at him walking in the door and changed that to I'm going to make this kid a black belt. I'm going to do it. And I know I'm going to do it. And I'm going to do it with the help of our instructors and not by myself. And I'm going to be happy as heck I did it. And I see that in him. And I think that uh, there was a, a thing on the website about doing the podcast today that, you know, I should I should think about any. Uh, advice I can give to any other martial artist, but you need to be able to, and this is the biggest one I'd say, you need to be able to s see the potential in every single st student because you don't know what kind of impact they're going to have on you or that you're going to have on them. And you have, no, you have no idea what their life is like and how much they need you. And I think he was just like the biggest example of that. So I tell you, it's, it's funny. Every time that, you know, there's a picture that someone captured of, you know, the exact moment of me, with my uh, a super ugly trying to hold in tears face and saying goodbye to this kid. Uh, and every time I see it, I'm like, man, I start tearing up again. So I think that was like, I definitely, once that happened this Saturday, I was like, I got to share that on Tuesday on the podcast or, you know, for listeners, I got to share this on insert whatever day you're listening here. Um, so I think that was my biggest moment re recently and I tell you, ever since then, I've been motivated as heck to keep going. Sensei McQuaid is one of the more interesting people I've met. He's not only a martial artist and an instructor, but an inspiring improv comedian. I love that combination. Sensei McQuaid has made teaching martial arts his passion, and I'm sure everyone in his classes can tell. We can see how the martial arts transformed him, and I thank him. Thank you, Sensei McQuaid, for coming on the show today. If you want to check out the show notes with photos, links, social media, all that, if you want to reach out to Sensei McQuaid, the best way to do that is through the show notes, whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. If you want to contact me, the best way is by email, jeremy at whistlekick.com. And you can find all of our social media at whistlekick.com.
Not dot com. Just at Whistlekick. I want to thank you for tuning in. I appreciate your time. Always open to feedback. We've got some great topic episodes, guest suggestions that have come in lately. Love it. Not only does it help us build the show that you want, but it makes our job easier. You tell us what you want and we do it. Perfect. But that's all for today. Until next time, train hard, smile, and have a great day.